Hello and welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine in which we discuss the ship's medicine chest. By the end of this session, you'll be able to identify who's responsible for managing medical supplies kept on board, list a minimum of three details to be kept in a medication tracking log, describe a drug rash, define controlled substances and discuss their storage, including the elements of a controlled substance log, list five analgesic medications that must be carried, and identify the IV fluid that you are required to carry. Ships that are subject to IMO and ILO regulations are required to have adequate medical supplies. And adequate is a term of art, in a sense, because the quantities will depend on a number of things. Uh, if you have hazardous cargo, you have additional requirements, longer duration, more crew, greater quantities. But there's a minimum recommended list that's set by the IMO of supplies that you need to have. The intent is to supply a range of medications that can treat most common shipboard medical emergencies for whatever duration is necessary until definitive care can be reached. So you've got this list of recommended meds and the IMO basically says you can add additional medications, you can even add medications with the same indications, but you can't substitute out any of the medications on the list. And you, the authority having jurisdiction for each country may also require additional medications or supplies, but those would be in addition to, not in place of, the IMO list. Now, ultimately, it's the master who's responsible for managing the medical supplies, but that responsibility can be delegated to someone who's properly trained. The IMO recommends that physician consultation be obtained. I would say that would be the case for most situations, but if the crew member is also a licensed medical professional, and I would say specifically physician, uh, physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, then those people really are able to practice independently and don't necessarily need to contact medical control. Uh, everyone else, I would recommend contacting medical control. So a big part of managing the medicine chest is keeping records. So the minimum record that you need for medications and medical supplies is the quantity, including decreasing quantity after use, increasing quantity after restocking, any expiration dates that are relevant, and they should be tracked both for the individual medications and for your equipment as a whole so you know how long what you have in stock with the minimum amount of time it's all good for and the storage conditions under which medications were kept because different medications have different storage requirements in your record of treatment you'll have a patient care report something to document the care that you provide the soap note the progress notes etc you'll also need to make a notation in the ship's log and some countries require this by law you have to have a record of treatment including the type and quantity of medications administered. In addition, the master needs to maintain a controlled substance log and that needs to be retained for two years after the date of last entry before it can be destroyed or discarded. So you've got the huge supply area, whether it be a medicine chest, whether it be cabinets or drawers, that include a number of medications and lots of them. And so you need to be able to identify them easily. We'll start by saying that all medications share the same generic name, but the brand names may be different in different countries. And so your packaging needs to include the generic name. It needs to include the dose per unit, whatever the unit is, a tablet, a capsule, a vial, a sublingual medication, an ampule, a bag, what, whatever it comes in, you need to know the dose and you need to know the expiration date. And if that packaging is illegible or it's unlabeled, the medication should be destroyed because you don't want to make an error in a, what's already a high stress situation by giving the wrong medication or an expired medication or the wrong dose. Now, storing your medications, you basically have three options, and it depends on the medication 
which option you're going to use for that particular medication. For the vast majority of your medications and your supplies, you're going to have drawers or medicine cabinets or some place where all these things are stored together. They need to be sorted in a way that you can figure out what they're for. So they may be sorted by type. So antibiotics go in one drawer, analgesics go in another drawer, um, antidiarrheals go in another drawer. They may be divided up by indication. So all your anti-infectives go into one drawer. So your antifungals and your antibiotics and antivirals if you have them and any immunizations that don't need to be refrigerated, that might all be in one place. And things for stomach upset might go into another. Or you could divide them by body system. So everything for the gut goes in here. Everything for the skin goes into this drawer. Everything for the lungs goes into a different drawer. But you want it organized in some way that you can find what you need easily and other people can find what they need. You're going to want to separate out your emergency medications, things you need immediately. You may have some of them in each of the other storage system places that you use, but you want to take adequate supply that in an emergency you don't have to go scrambling through different places to find your emergency medication. So whether you have a single dedicated drawer that's just emergency medications, whether you have a small bag where those medications go in that you can open up and everything's easily arranged, it doesn't matter, but you need to have something so that you can easily access your emergency medications. Now some medications need to be refrigerated and so you will have a dedicated single-use refrigerator that exists only to refrigerate your refrigerate your drugs that require refrigeration. You can't store anything else in there. It needs to be locked and that's where those medications go. And then controlled substances need to be locked in a safe, preferably in the master's safe, in a room that's locked when it's unoccupied. So essentially double locking. Either there's always someone in the room monitoring a locked safe or the door, exterior door, and the safe are both locked. So very secure. So what are controlled substances? Those are medications that countries put additional restrictions on because there's a high risk for abuse. So these are medications that people would use to get high or would otherwise abuse. And so they need to be kept in a safe in a locked room. Typically they need to be separately declared to customs and usually the supplies are much more tightly limited than for other medications that have a low abuse uh, potential. Uh, so you're going to need to keep a controlled substance log. Anytime a dose is given you have to record the dose, who ordered it, the physician, the name of the person administering it and the name of the patient. It's a record of any lost or destroyed doses and what happened to them. And I would add to that that you will routinely need to destroy additional drug that you don't use. So you draw up 10 milligrams of morphine, you give 5 milligrams, the patient feels much better, there's 5 milligrams left. You want a witness to sign beside your name when that drug is destroyed. You need to keep a running count of the remaining stock so that's based on your use and what you had to start with but also a weekly actual count compared to the running count so that you can identify diversion and you need to do that for all of your controlled substances so each week you're going to need to count how many you have compare it to how many you're supposed to have and if there's a discrepancy you need to create an incident report and figure out what happened there are some analgesics that you are required to have uh, on the IMO list. Paracetamol or acetaminophen, so commonly known as Tylenol. Acetylsalicylic acid, commonly known as aspirin. Ibuprofen. Tramadol, which may not be a medication that many people are familiar with. It is considered a non-opioid opioid receptor agonist. So it, it works like an opioid. Um, for years, these were marketed as being much safer than the equivalent opioids. They actually have the same abuse and addiction potential as other opioids, even though they are called a non-opioid. And uh, they have the added side benefit of uh, potentiating seizures. So uh, it's a medication that you have to have. But if you can have another oral narcotic 
available um, hydrocodone, oxycodone, or a similar, that's probably a good idea. Um, although there are a lot of places in the world where tramadol is commonly used and you are required to have that as well. And morphine. And you'll have both oral forms and IV or IM forms of morphine available to you. And we've covered pain control uh, elsewhere, but you're going to use this pain control ladder to work your way through to determine what the most effective medication is for a given patient, but you want it to be the safest medication as well. So you're picking the you're working your way through this ladder of medications, increasing to stronger and less safe medications as needed till you find the balance of safety and efficacy. The IMO requires that you have normal saline or sodium chloride 0.9%. Uh, other agencies may require you to have additional IV fluids like lactated ringers or D5W or D10W, but the IMO only requires normal saline. And you need to be able to calculate a flow rate. So medical control tells you you have to give this much fluid per hour to this patient. You need to be able to figure out, am I giving the right amount of fluid? And you need to be able to do it in shorter time intervals than every hour taking a look at the bag and seeing if you gave the right amount. You'll do that too, but you need to be a bit more precise. And we do that on a permanent basis. So it's based on the drip set. The drip set says there's this many drops per ml and drops after you started the IV you look in the drip chamber each of those little drops that comes through a certain number of those drops makes an ml. For a macro drop set which is what we'll mostly use that's 10, 15, or 20 drops per ml. If you multiply drops per ml times mls per minute you get drops per minute. So you just need to figure out how many mls per minute you need to give to the patient look at the drip set and figure out how many drops per ml, multiply them together and you'll figure out your drops per minute. So if medical control orders 200 mls per hour of normal saline and you've got a 15 drop per ml set, 200 mls per hour divided by 60 minutes per hour equals 3.33 mls per minute. 15 drops per ml times 3.33 ml per minute is 50 drops per minute. So you would count for one minute and make sure that you're giving 50 drops per minute or you can divide that and figure out per second although you get to a really difficult time reaching precision there because that's slightly less than one drop per second you could say 25 drops in 30 seconds and look and, and see if you're right and then you adjust the roller clamp remembering that if you lift the IV bag up or down relative to the patient you get more or less flow so you need to have the bag in the same place it will also change as you have less fluid in the bag so it'll flow more slowly as there's less of a pressure head pushing the fluid through so you have to constantly monitor that but that's how you calculate your drip rate what do you need to have and how much well the IMO list of recommended medications and equipment tells you what you need to have and the IMO has a text called the quantification addendum for the International Medical Guide for Ships that tells you how much of each medication you need based on where you're going and your crew and the duration of the journey. So when you give a medication you're responsible for the effects of that medication. Side effects, uh, allergic reactions and others. Medication reactions are very common. Usually it's a little bit of nausea, or upset stomach, maybe a little bit of diarrhea. That's not really worrisome but skin rashes are also frequent effects of medication reactions and usually they're just annoying so you see that leg in the middle there that's something called erythema multiforme it's red bumps the center is a little bit clear they coalesce together there may be just a few scattered ones there may be a lot like this patient has there aren't other symptoms with it and if you stop the medication it'll go away and so you want to stop the medication because the, that can progress to something called Stevens-Johnson. And so if you look at the patient on the right, he's got Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And he starts to get blisters. The skin starts to slough off. They get blisters on the mucous membranes. And they can't eat. They can't drink. They become dehydrated. They become susceptible to super infection. It's like a patient with a bad burn. 
And so any patient that you start on a medication who then develops a blistering rash needs to be evacuated because you're worried that they're going to progress to this state. And the treatment for the Stevens-Johnson syndrome itself is to stop the medication. You stop the trigger causing the problem, but it's the effects from the blistering, from the involvement of the mucous membranes that are really problematic. And then, of course, drugs can also cause allergic reactions. So patients may end up with urticaria or hives. And so you need to monitor for that as well. If your patient develops hives, if they're just hives and no other symptoms, you treat them symptomatically. The diphenhydramine as an antihistamine, the ranitidine as an H2 antihistamine blocker, um, possibly steroids, depending on how significant an effect it is. If they have any signs of anaphylaxis, so swelling in the face, changes in the voice, uh, edema other places, swollen lips, trouble breathing, wheezing, low blood pressure, palpitations, high heart rate, or GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, if that shows, if they've got that, that's what you're seeing, then they need to be treated for anaphylaxis. So you add epinephrine, you give IV fluids, you do those other treatments. Um, and once you've treated them, it's just like any other anaphylactic or allergic reaction. Based on their response, you have to make a decision about evacuation. But be aware of this and tell all of your patients when you start them on any medication, if you get any side effects, particularly any rashes, let me know immediately. Please complete any associated knowledge reviews, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your instructor or professor. Thank you very much.